Good morning, dear friends. I am Dr. Ashish Atre from Star Imaging Center, Pune, and I would be talking to you about intraventricular tumors, their imaging, and case-based approach. The objectives of this presentation are going to be to name different types of intraventricular tumors that we commonly see in clinical practice, to understand the origin of these tumors, to look at the imaging characteristics, and to check how we can set our differential diagnostic lists. We will begin with this presentation by looking at the anatomy and embryology of ventricular system. As you know, the cerebral ventricles begin as ependymal outfunctioning from the cranial end of the neural tube, which are called as telencephalic vesicles. The choroid plexus, which develops as an invagination of primitive pia and arachnoid along with the vessels, in these vesicles creates a fissure through which it invaginates, which is called choroidal fissure. The epithelial lining of the ventricles is composed of ependymal cells, which give rise to the tumor, which we call as ependymoma. Beneath this ependymal lining is the subependymal tissue, which is composed of glial cells and forms the subependymoma. The septum pellucidum, which separates the two lateral ventricles, is also lined by glial cells and some residua of neuronal precursor cells from which central neurocytoma arises. And the vascular choroid plexus, which as all of us know, produces cerebrospinal fluid, can give rise to neoplasms, which are called as choroid plexus tumors, composing of choroid plexus tumors, atypical choroid plexus papillomas and choroid plexus carcinomas. Now, during this invagination of choroid plexus into the lateral ventricle, some mesenchymal cells, which are called arachnoid cap cells, could get trapped in these arachnoid granulations and could form the eventual meningioma, which could be have an intraventricular location. Now, before we, begin with, before we begin with this presentation, there are two important things that we should know about intraventricular tumors and setting up the differential diagnostic list. One of the most important thing is the location of this tumor. And the second important thing is the age of the patient. If you have got these two things right, then this set of differential diagnostic possibilities is pretty easy to set in. Of course, you could look at another thing, that is if the patient has a known primary, then you would obviously think an intraventricular tumor could be a metastasis. Or another thing to look at is if there is a history of tuberous sclerosis in this patient, when you are straight away going to definitely list subependymal giant cell astrocytoma as a possibility if you, th if you see a tumor adjacent to foramen of Monroe. Now, if you were to put these two things together, that is the location of the lesion and the age of the patient, we could sort of enlist our differential diagnosis depending upon these two factors. For example, if we see a tumor which is located in the anterior part of the body or the frontal horn of lateral ventricle in an adult patient, we would think about a central neurocytoma or an ependymoma. While if we see this tumor in an adult patient located in the trigone or atrium of the lateral ventricle, then meningioma and metastasis are our going to be the chief differential diagnostic possibilities. As against that, the same location of the tumor in a child would prompt us to list choroid plexus tumor as our first possibility. Same thing applies as far as the third or fourth ventricular tumors go. For example, intra-fourth ventricular tumor in a child, we would think of ependymoma as the first possibility, while in an adult, choroid plexus tumor and subependymoma would be our differential diagnosis. Now, depending upon where these tumors arise, we could kind of differentiate them as to whether they arise from ventricular wall or ventricular lumen. Now, tumors which arise from ventricular wall could be either from ependymal lining, as we know it is called ependymoma, it could be from subependymal tissue, or it could be from glial and neuronal precursor cells as they line, for example, septum pellucidum. If the tumor is arising within the ventricular lumen, then the most common uh, etiology from where it arises is going to be choroid plexus. Of course, choroid plexus is extremely vascular. So because there are blood vessels, a tumor could 
could arise from mesenchymal cells of these blood vessels or it could arise from arachnoid capsules which get trapped within this choroid plexus during development. Now let's begin our discussion by looking at lateral in intralateral ventricular tumors. And in children, as I said, the commonest tumor in this uh, area is going to be choroid plexus tumor. Of course, subependymal giant cell tumor in the anterior part of the third ventricle adjacent to the foramen of Monroe and primitive neuroectodermal tumor are other possibilities. While in adults, it could be either meningioma, metastasis, central neurocytoma or lymphoma. We will first see about the choroid plexus tumors. Now, choroid plexus tumors are of three types and the differentiation of these tumors is essentially histological and imaging has very little role to play in this differentiation. The three tumors which are grouped in this group are choroid plexus papilloma, atypical choroid plexus tumor and a frank carcinoma which is called choroid plexus carcinoma. Let's look at some relevant statistics. 2 to 4 percent of the brain tumors in pediatric age group are actually choroid plexus tumors while they form only 0.5 percent in adult brain. The most common location as we saw is atrium of the lateral ventricle but 40 percent could be seen in fourth and 10 percent in third ventricle. Now fourth ventricular tumor have a male preponderance. The lateral ventricular tumors are common in children. Almost 80 percent of uh, choroid plexus tumors in children occur in lateral ventricle while fourth ventricular tumor have an equal distribution amongst all ages and there are a few syndromic association. Choroid plexus carcinoma is a tumor which is exclusively restricted to pediatric population and almost never seen in adults. Now the most common presentation of choroid plexus tumors is because of the ventricular dilatation that is hydrocephalus and raised intracranial pressure. Now this hydrocephalus could be either because of overproduction as we know the choroid plexus is responsible for formation of CSF. So there could be overproduction of CSF by these tumors. There could be defective absorption due to the proteinaceous exudates and hemorrhage that are associated with choroid plexus tumors leading to several additions or it could be due to direct obstruction to the CSF flow because of the tumor attaining a large size or being located in locations like third or fourth ventricle. Imaging wise on CT scan we see this tumor to be slightly hyperdense or isodense to gray matter uh, on uh, plane scan and they generally enhance brilliantly on post contrast study. Some areas of calcification and hemorrhage is a possibility. The tumors typically have this irregular frond like appearance at the periphery which is called cauliflower like appearance. Some cystic areas could be seen and some septation and cystic changes are not very unusual. In fact, the ventricle in which this tumor is present could be associated with several septations within which are separate from the tumor and this is basically because of the proteinaceous secretions that arise from this tumor causing intraventricular adhesions. Also, because these tumors are very vascular and tend to bleed, these adhesions could be formed secondary to intraventricular hemorrhage. On MRI, these tumors on T1 weighted images are again classically slightly hypo to isodense to cortical gray matter. They are hypo intense on T2 weighted images. Again, they show this irregular frond like appearance at the periphery and enhance brilliantly on post contrast study. You could see several areas of flow voids because these tumors are extremely vascular and you could also see presence of blood degradation products. Now some amount of periventricular vasogenic edema may occur in choroid plexus tumor irrespective of their histology and it does not necessarily indicate parenchymal invasion and this surrounding edema can be seen in all types of choroid plexus tumors. Now choroid plexus tu carcinoma is a tumor which as we saw is restricted to pediatric population and around 80% of choroid plexus carcinomas arise in children. It is a WHO grade 3 tumor. The distinction or differentiation between papilloma and carcinoma on imaging is almost impossible. Though we may see heterogeneity, cystic changes, areas of hemorrhage 
and parenchymal invasion more common commonly with choroid plexus carcinoma as compared to other two types of choroid plexus tumors but histologically many a times you need uh, immunohistochemistry to distinguish between choroid plexus carcinoma and the other two choroid plexus tumors but what pathologist is looking at evidence of is obvious invasion of adjacent neural tissue with infiltrating cells and stro on a stromal base loss of regular papillary architecture and evidence of increased mitotic activity nuclear atypia and necrosis so all these things are the ones which histologically differentiate choroid plexus carcinoma from benign parachoroid plexus tumors now this is an example of choroid plexus carcinoma just looks like any other choroid plexus tumors only for the fact that it is more heterogeneous as you can see there are several cystic areas there is a lot of vasogenic edema around it and there are some areas of hemorrhage which are looking dark on these situated images in adults or in children a intra fourth ventricular tumor which has this kind of a calcification and enhanced brilliantly on post contrast ct scan could be a choroid plexus a choroid plexus tumor now atypical location as we saw in this patient just a few days back is the anterior part of the lateral ventricle in the area of frontal horn adjacent to the foramen of monro now this tumor is nearly iso intense on these flare images shows marked susceptibility and enhances brilliantly on post contrast study looking as a filling defect in this dilated frontal horn of right lateral ventricle and then there are few occasions where you just know that this tumor is likely to be intra third ventricle ventricular and you cannot really predict the histology as happened with this child who has a large heterogeneous lesion which is completely intra third ventricular has this few areas of necrosis or cystic changes is brilliantly enhancing and has some amount of vasogenic edema in adjacent thalamus it is obviously causing obstruction to both lateral ventricles with resultant dilatation of ventricular lumen the perfusion uh, evaluation in these choroid plexus tumors shows this tumor to be extremely hyperperfused as we see here and in fact because of there is excessive contrast leakiness in this tumors due to lack of blood brain barrier the contrast material tends to persist within the interstitium of this tumor for a long period of time spectroscopy is not really specific but it is supposed to show a prominent choline peak with complete absence of na and creatinine but and creatine i'm sorry but the as we see in this patient what we are seeing is we are also seeing na uh, creatine and choline a large choline peak this turned out to be a benign choroid plexus tumor which was intra third ventricular spectroscopy is not really helpful in differentiating one type of choroid plexus tumor from another and we cannot differentiate choroid plexus carcinoma from the benign variant of choroid plexus tumors central neuro uh, neuro axis dissemination along the csf spaces is a known feature of choroid plexus tumors and we saw this in this patient with there are multiple csf seedlings not only in the brain but also along the spinal cord moving on to the next tumor which is subependymal giant cell tumor which is a who grade 1 tumor and it is exclusively seen in patients who are suffering from tuberous sclerosis in fact 5 to 15 percent patients of tuberous sclerosis could develop this tumor and only thing which differentiates subependymal giant cell tumor from subependymal heterotopia is the interval growth or development of hydrocephalus previously it was said that enhancement or a size more than 12 mm could be distinguishing factors but we know that they no longer distinguish subependymal giant cell tumors from the heterotopia and it is it is only the increase in size which we can demonstrate with interval ct scans or development of a new hydrocephalus which will prompt us to think about these tumors being subependymal giant cell astrocytomas now imaging wise there is nothing specific apart from the location which is adjacent to foramen of monro projecting into the frontal horns of lateral ventricle these tumors on plain ct scan are again slightly hyperdense they could have these areas of calcification enhancement is a definite feature and these tumors are commonly associated with obstructive hydrocephalus
on MR imaging, these tumors project in the frontal horn of lateral ventricles and they are ISO to hypo intense on T1 weighted images. They tend to be ISO to hypo intense and are surrounded by the intraventricular CSF on T2 weighted images. Flare shows similar signal intensity to cortical gray matter and enhancement as on CT is a characteristic features, feature of this tumor. Of course, if you see associated subependymal or subcortical tubers, then uh, it is an easier diagnosis to make even if you don't have history of tuberous sclerosis. In this child, we clearly see presence of adenoma sebaceum and this uh, he has calcified areas around the uh, foramen of Monroe on either side and development of this, of this large lesion which was small to begin with and has grown over time, MR showing brilliant enhancement in this lesion. In adult, a tumor in similar location would be a central neurocytoma and this accounts for about 0.25% to 0.5% of intracranial tumors. This was first described in 1982 and previously this was, this was labeled as an intraventricular oligodendroglioma. The exact origin of, uh, the, of these tumors is uh, still doubtful, but it is supposed to be arising from bipotential progenitor cells that are capable of both neuronal as well as glial differentiation. Now, classically it is, it is located in the anterior part of the third ventricle either arising from the septum pellucidum or the lateral ventricular wall, but it could also have an extra ventricular location and it occurs in adults, though in early childhood or neonatal period also there are a few case reports. What we see on imaging as a, is a well circumscribed lobulated mass that has a very variegated appearance with multiple cysts. Hemorrhage is rare, but calcification is common and it classically has a bubbly appearance on MR images due to presence of multiple cysts. Enhancement is generally very prominently seen and spectroscopy is supposed to show a prominent glycine peak at 3.55 ppm. Now this is an example of a 46 year old lady who, whose presentation was with headache and we see a tumor in the anterior part of the lateral ventricle. It, has, it is slightly hyperdense on plane scan with multiple areas of calcification, multiple cysts as I just told you and brilliant enhancement on post contrast study. Another lady, intraventricular tumor on right side now with the anterior part of the third ventricle, very heterogeneous signal pattern on T1 and T2 weighted images with susceptibility imaging showing multiple areas of a signal loss which were due to calcification and it is showing enhancement with multiple non-enhancing cystic areas which are appearing extremely bright on T2 weighted images consistent with cystic appearance. The signal characteristic of the intraventricular CSF associated with these tumors could also change because of presence of proteinaceous contents in the obstructed ventricular system. These tumors also could be hyperperfused. The solid part could be hyperperfused as we are seeing here, and the spectroscopy is pretty non specific. A tumor which is not located in this classical location, as we are seeing here, a lat the tumor located in the temporal horn of right lateral ventricle, having a very heterogeneous kind of signal pattern with variegated enhancement, a large area of necrosis, a prominent choline peak on the spectroscopy and extreme high perfusion in the solid part of the lesion which is predominantly peripheral. Now this turned out to be a intraventricular glioma. A tumor which is located slightly posteriorly adjacent to the choroid plexus in the region of trigone and atrium of lateral ventricle in an adult is likely to be meningioma and this meningioma arises from arachnoid cap cells which are trapped in the choroid plexus during development and as we know the most common location is the atrium of the lateral ventricle. As with other meningiomas it tends to have more of female preponderance and it is commonly seen in adult but occasionally uh, it can be seen in children. On CT these tumors are classically hyperdense 
and on MR, they are T1 ISO to hypo and continue to be so on T2 weighted images. Brilliant enhancement is a feature, calcification is common, they are hyperperfused and the, the on spectroscopy one could see the alanine doublet at 1.47 ppm. Now ventricular dilatation could be seen and more importantly periventricular edema which, uh, which is due to seepage of CSF uh, due to trans ependymal CSF flow obstruction could be seen uh, in these tumors. The CSF-like uh, signal in the periventricular white matter or interstitial edema could be also due to the uh, endothelial growth factor which this uh, tumor secrete which extends into the periventricular white matter responsible for interstitial edema. A typical example of intraventricular meningioma on CT, a hyperadense tumor just like an extraaxial meningioma that we commonly seen, brilliant enhancement, hardly any cystic component in it, entire solid tumor with some amount of periventricular edema. On MR, such classical meningioma would look nearly iso intense on T1, it is bright on flare, there, is, there could be diffusion restriction due to high cellularity and near homogeneous enhancement with smooth counter of the tumor located adjacent to the choroid plexus in the trigone or atrium of the lateral ventricle. Such large choroid plexus tumors may appear very heterogeneous on T2 weighted images but the enhancement almost always is very uniform and they could have lobulated outlines like this as we saw in choroid plexus tumor. So even meningiomas could have this outline which is very irregular and is lobulated. Tumor in similar location, if you have a patient who has a known primary, you are obviously going to think about metastasis because these metastases tend to be located in and around the choroid plexus because of its high vascularity and they could also be seen in the third and fourth ventricle. Of course, the most common tumors are renal cell carcinoma, breast CA and lung carcinoma. The best clue for raising the possibility of an intraventricular tumor being metastasis is seeing multiple other lesions in brain or you know that patient has a known primary. One condition which you should not mistake for a choroid plexus related tumor in an adult is the presence of these bulky lesions uh, which are involving the choroid plexus which look nearly iso to slightly hyper intense on flare images and look very bright on diffusion weighted MR images. Now uh, these are the xanthogranuloma of choroid plexus which is essentially a degenerative condition and though they look to be tumor like or bulky they are not to be mistaken for intraventricular tumor. Now a rare intraventricular tumor uh, is which is located in the anterior third ventricle is a choroidoid glioma. Now the exact cell of origin of this tumor is not known. It receives its name because histologically the cells appear similar to choroidomas and the classical location is in the anterior third ventricle. The, the most important or characteristic feature of this tumor is the location and brilliant enhancement. Signal characteristic wise it is not very specific, it generally is iso to hypo on T1 and slightly bright on T2 and flare images. Moving on to the posterior fossa that is the intra fourth ventricular tumor, in children ependymoma is the most common one while in adults it is choroid plexus tumors and the subependymoma. Now fourth ventricular ependymoma are uh, well circumscribed glial tumors which occur anywhere in the fourth ventricle, cranial or caudal part. These tumors are extremely well circumscribed. They tend to have multiple areas of hemorrhage. Calcification is not unusual. They are extremely hyperperfused on the perfusion scan and they enhance brilliantly. Some cystic changes can be seen. Diffusion restriction is not classically seen and that's how it, it could help us in differentiating them 
from a medulloblastoma which tends to have diffusion restriction more or less as a universal feature but ependymoma could also be diffusion uh, restricted and they could e extend in along the CSF pathway into the foramen of Lushka or Majendi. These tumors occur in posterior fossa more commonly in children. Uh, while this, if they occur supratentorially, then the mean age of presentation is between 18 to 24 years. As we saw, these tumors are predominantly solid. They could have cystic components. Calcification is common. Hemorrhage is not unusual. Diffusion restriction is variable. And brilliant enhancement is a typical feature. Extension of these tumors in, into fourth ventricular outlet foramina is a classical sign and it is called as squeezed toothpaste appearance as we see here a tumor in the left foramen of Lushka. In fact, in a child, if one sees an apparently extraaxial le lesion like say in foramen of Lushka or Majendi, it is best to look for a small intra fourth ventricular tumor from which this is occurred as an extension. In fact, the ext apparently extraaxial lesions in posterior fossa in children are more likely to be extension of the intraaxial lesions like ependymoma along the CSF outlet foramina of fourth ventricle. It is not that all ependymomas always enhance brilliantly. This is a large intra fourth ventricular tumor extending right till the aqueduct causing obstructive dilatation. This tumor does not have much of diffusion restriction, has little bit of contrast enhancement as we see here. So in my differential diagnosis, ependymoma was not first. I in fact thought of a subependymoma, but this did turn out to be an ependymoma and the spectroscopy had shown a prominent choline peak with nearly absent NA and creatine. When this tumor uh, occur in supratentorial compartment, most of the times they are periventricular. They again tend to be very heterogeneous large tumors which have presence of blood degradation products as in this case they could have calcification, have significant surrounding vasogenic edema and they could infiltrate surrounding brain parenchyma. The sister concern as I call it of ependymoma is subependymoma. And these tumors are thought to arise from the subependymal glial layer surrounding the cerebral ventricles, but the exact histogenesis remains uncertain. Most of these lesions occur in the fourth ventricle and few in lateral ventricles. They are more commonly seen in male patients and 82% of them occur in patients who are older than 15 years of age. Most patients are asymptomatic and those who are symptomatic are basically because of the raised intracranial pressure resulting from obstruction to the CSF flow. These tumors are also extremely well circumscribed. Now they are generally uh, solid but they could have cystic component. The enhancement pattern is variable but most of them show minimal enhancement. There is no uh, extension into or invasion of the surrounding brain parenchyma and these tumors do not have any CSF dissemination. Now this is a small tumor that we see in the lateral part of the fourth ventricle. It is slightly bright on T2. It is hardly seen on T1 weighted images but it is nearly iso to hypo intense almost similar to the CSF signal intensity in the fourth ventricle but it is slightly brighter as compared to the CSF in the fourth ventricle and it if we it, it is best seen on the flare images because of the suppression of the CSF signal, these tumors appear as a hyperintensity. Another example of the subependymoma, this time in the lower part of the fourth ventricle. Now, this tumor appears entirely solid. It is nearly iso-intense to gray matter on T2-weighted images. In fact, it is very difficult to see this tumor on these sagittal T2-weighted images except for the fact that it is appearing as a filling defect in the fourth ventricle, but it is better seen on flare images as slightly bright to the cerebellar gray matter and brainstem. Uh, and these tumors generally do not enhance. Now this was a tumor which I again thought was a subependymoma which is not enhancing at all but histologically 
turned out to be the rosette forming glioneural tumor of fourth ventricle. Now, this is again a bright tumor on flare images. These tumors tend to be well circumscribed, have heterogeneous solid and cystic areas and they are classically centered in onto the fourth ventricle. They have heterogeneous enhancement. Here we did not see any enhancement in these tumors and they demonstrate both glial as well as neuronal differentiation. And we need to consider this diagnosis in any intra fourth ventricular tumor which is appearing predominantly cystic and is not enhancing. Now this is a rare entity and this is the only tumor I have seen in clinical practice. Now lastly, let's look at a few tumors which, which new few non-tumor conditions which can present as intraventricular masses. Uh, a large area of signal alteration in the temporal horn of right lateral ventricle. It is appearing hyper to iso intense on T1 weighted images and is bright, but it is very heterogeneous. It does not enhance on post contrast study, but the real clue is the diffusion weighted MR images which show this to be extremely bright. So this was an epidermoid which was extending into the uh, temporal horn of lateral ventricle. Another structure, another lesion which we should remember is the colloid cyst of the third ventricle. It is very easy to miss this lesion on the flare and T2 weighted images, but on T1 this is this generally shows a T1 bright structure, though it could have a very variegated signal intensity. Location is typical or another cystic lesion as we see in this fourth ventricle clearly showing you this cyst wall and the resultant obstructive hydrocephalus but we see a tiny enhancing nodule which is located at the periphery of this large cystic lesion. This was an intraventricular cysticercosis. So the take home message of this talk will be that the intraventricular tumors are kind of get me lesions. They are difficult to miss except for the colloid cyst. Hydrocephalus is the most common presenting features with raised intracranial tension. Differential diagnostic list is very short and location and age of the patients really help you in narrowing these differential diagnostic possibilities. And if there are atypical tumors, then we really have to leave it, leave it to histopathologists because we as radiologists hardly can do anything about it. So thank you very much for your patient hearing. See you at some other time.